Deep inside the heart of Segmentum Obscurus, just outside the Great Rift, sits a horrifying carnival of violence. It is a place of savagery, depravity, and gore. It is the one place in the galaxy where champions of Slanesh and Khorne can exchange niceties and restrain themselves from tearing one another apart. It is the Carnival of Slaughter. Here, in this unhallowed place, champions of Khorne and Slanesh unite in worship of the one thing that their gods have in common. Spectacle. Indeed, while Khorne may be honourable, blunt and brutal, and while Slanesh may be sacrilegious, elegant and beautiful, they both love the thrill of the arena. They love the roar of the crowd, the baying for blood, and the grand performance that follows it. And thus, in this carnival, their burning hatred for one another simmers down to a bitter rivalry, one which is cathartically realised in the carnival's many games. But in order to understand how this horrific synthesis of contradictory ideals came to be, one must understand the circumstances of the carnival's founders, Amaria Viseri and Calvar Viseri. The Viseri Twins Many centuries ago, the paradise planet of Aradisus stood as one of the few bastions of comfort in Segmentum Obscurus. Given its proximity to the war front against chaos, Aradisus was a common retirement spot for those incredibly few commissars, inquisitors and generals who earned such a rare reward as retirement. Naturally, Aradisus became a planet of rigorous patriotism where the children of the new generations were taught to revere and one day emulate the military actions of the old. This brings us to the children of Lord Commissar Lornik Viseri, a man who had fought face to face with the taint of chaos and had earned his retirement after a 20-year-long campaign, culminating in the annihilation of a Lord of Change. He had come to Aradisus with the hope of siring children to continue the fight in his stead. And when his wife bore his twin children, Calvar and Amaria, it seemed that they would do just that. By just the age of 14, Calva had been excelling so well in his physical exams and military studies that he was a likely recruitment candidate for the forces of the Adeptus Astartes. Furthermore, his sister Amaria had received her certificate for status as a sanctioned psyker after showing remarkable control of her abilities for her age and training, and was even being considered for a position as a member of the Ordo Malleus. And perhaps, in a kinder galaxy, they might have taken up those very positions. But this is not a kind galaxy, and paradise worlds of such repute do not last long. Seeking vengeance against the Imperial legends that lived there, a chaos undivided warband called the Progeny of Shadow tore through Aradisus' system, ripping through world after world, and stealing away their children to add to the ranks of the many traitor chapters that made up their disdainful lot. The progeny quickly conquered Aradisus, beheaded Lord Commissar Lonic before his children, and dragged them away to become recruitment stock for minor sub-factions within the warband. Amaria was given to the ecstatic court, a Slaneshi cult dedicated to the summoning of demons. Calva was given to the arterial host, a cornate chapter dedicated to twisted honor wars. And while neither of these chaotic bands knew it, Soon after the progeny of Shadow broke apart under its own weight, these unassuming children would become the masters of the forces that sought to enslave them. Amaria Viseri, the Craven Queen of the Ecstatic Court. Luckily for Amaria, the force that stole her away was no Chaos Space Marine chapter. The leaders of the Ecstatic Court were just as mortal as she was, and thus just as prone to fatal errors. One such error was attempting to exploit her raw psychic talent to summon demons. Their leaders tormented her for years on end, hoping to bend her talents to the will of Slanesh. And while they eventually succeeded in breaking Amaria's will and turning her to the forces of Chaos, it was not to their benefit. For when Amaria called out to Slanesh and summoned forth a hideous mass of demonettes, it was not so they might serve the ecstatic court. It was so they might take it over, in her name. And so Amaria, having just reached the cusp of maturity, became the leader of the ecstatic court, and a lifetime of depravity and profanity awaited her. She began by seeking out worlds of righteousness and purity, worlds that echoed the now hollow lessons of her dead father, and desecrating their churches, temples, and scholars. By her hand, planets of virtue were twisted into hedonistic offerings to Slanesh, carnivalesque mockeries of the ecclesiarchal ideals they represented just weeks beforehand. At the climax of each of these depraved ritualistic war efforts, Amaria would make a grand offering to Slanesh. In return, Slanesh would grant her a boon of some sort, be it a relic of great power, a blessing for her demon host, or 
On rare occasions, the loyalty of a keeper of secrets, another duke in her court of ecstasies. Had she been abducted by a Chaos Marine chapter, it is likely that Amaria would have been kept eternally a slave, never allowed to reach her full potential. But now, the master of her own domain, she was able to bring even Space Marines to heal with her mighty horde of terrible demons. But just as impressive as Amaria's meteoric rise to her place as Craven Queen is that of her brother Calvars. Calvar Viseri, the Gristle Lord of the Arterial Host. Calvar was given to the Arterial Host, a cornet warband assembled of traitor marines from various, especially bloody loyalist chapters, including but not limited to the Blood Angels, Marines Malevolent, Carcharidons, Space Falls, and so on. The twisted traditions of each of these chapters serve to make the Arterial Host far more prone to acts of ritual, worship, and hollow invocations of quote-unquote justice than the average servants of Korn. Korn may not care from whence blood flows, but the same cannot always be said for his servants. The sense of honour with which the Arterial Host conducted itself spoke greatly to Calvar's own, even if he was initially horrified by their actions. With the brutal teachings of the Warband's leaders, he quickly completed his challenges as an initiate in the years it took him to mature to adulthood and became the Warband's greatest berserker in the decades to come. But it wasn't long before Calvo's sense of honor and glory demanded that he challenge the arterial host's tyrannical lord, Vedra Canel. In Calvo's mind, Vedrak had grown complacent, seeking petty skirmishes wherever he could find them, rather than brutal wars wherever they were necessary. Calvo's descent sparked a civil war within the warband, one that almost drove it to extinction. Nevertheless, Calvar prevailed, slaughtering his opponents and beheading Vedrak in front of those few who remained to support him. Shortly afterward, Calvar decided to show his loyalty to Korn by burning the gristle of his fallen foes on a gigantic pyre in a grand ritual of gore, leaving nothing but congealed blood and blackened bone in its place. Thus, Calvar Viseri became the Gristle Lord, the Grisly Honor King, and the Blood Burner. His ritualistic sacrifice of gristle and meat to corn, alongside blood and skulls, became a haunting trademark that easily identified the sites of his conquests. If not by the side of scorched flesh across pyres, then by the planet-wide stench of cooked meat. The Viseri Reunion And now, at last, we come to the reunion of these twin figures, separated by circumstance, yet bound by fate. Calvar had had stories of the Craven Queen and her ecstatic court, just as Amaria had heard stories of the Gristle Lord and his arterial host. Each of them were disgusted by what they heard. After all, the Craven Queen's conquests were profane and perverted dedications to beauty, while the Gristle Lords were sanctified and honorable rituals to gore. The Craven Queen summoned demons to make up her court. The Gristle Lord insisted on minimizing the use of demons in his host. They were in every way both equal and opposite, a fact which infuriated them both. At once, both the Gristle Lord and the Craven Queen silently decided to go to war with one another, and, given their close proximity to the world that had once been called Aradissus, now a wretched demon world of chaos undivided, they each believed that fate had led them there to do battle. They both touched down on the planet's surface and began their march to the battlefield to be. And yet, when the twins saw each other across the battlefield, warped by demonic power and age, somehow they recognized one another. Perhaps it was simply wishful thinking that proved to be true. Perhaps it was some kind of kindred linking of their very souls since birth. Or perhaps it was simple familial instinct. But now, Calva and Amaria Viseri knew two things. Firstly, that the sibling they had thought dead for centuries was alive and well. And secondly, that they would have to kill each other in the name of their dark gods. Neither could stomach such a thought easily. With little hesitation, using every inch of their authority, they each immediately called their forces to heal. Demons snarled at each other from across the field, furious that their mortal masters would defy them to go to their holy war, while marines and cultists alike bellowed at their leaders, both angered and bewildered by the sudden halt in their advance towards their hated foes. Once the uproar had settled into an uneasy silence, Calvar and Amaria took their steps toward the center of the battlefield. A sense of melancholy and despair racked their minds. They had finally been reunited after centuries of being alone, 
and now they would have to destroy each other, until a stroke of genius struck them both at once. In a haunting unison, the twins gave a grand speech to their bloodthirsty allies on either side of the battlefield. Calvo professed that the lascivious underhandedness of the forces of Slanesh could not be tolerated, while Amaria declared that the joyless brutality of the forces of Khorne were just as abominable. Calvo insisted that the forces of Slanesh must be made to fight on even terms, while Amaria insisted that the forces of Khorne must be made to display some sense of showmanship. And so, they declared to their armies, whose fury had now faded and been replaced by a macabre excitement, that they would erect a grand carnival, a glorious gladiatorial arena of spectacle, one which would finally decide once and for all which of the two gods was greater. Amaria declared herself the master of pleasures, while Calvar declared himself the master of blood. Together, they would lead this grim carnival and organize the honorable and dramatic tournaments between their forces. Never before had such compromise been reached between two opposing forces of chaos, let alone one that has lasted as long as the Carnival of Slaughter. It seems that, in spite of how selfish and disloyal their original motives were, the Viseri twins' harebrained scheme, in the name of cooperation between Khorne and Slanesh, has received the tacit approval of their deities. Carnival Battles since that fateful day, marines and cultists of both Khorne and Slanesh have journeyed to Aradesis en masse. Some hope to build temples and holy sites to their god within view of the carnival. Others hope to compete in the various duels and tournaments, fighting for the honor and glory of their god. And yet others, as is more common within the devotees of Slanesh, simply want to enjoy the festivities. The competitions are exciting and greatly varied, their existence facilitated by Calva and Amaria. Amaria and a council of Slaneshi cultists handpick the champions of each fight, their desire to see a dramatic show of skill and beauty, vastly outweighing their desire to win. Meanwhile, Calva and a selected group of Cornet marines act as impartial judges in the games, their devotion to their gods' tenets of honor and fair play rendering them incapable of favoritism. Thus, with Slaneshi forces as the organizers and Cornet forces as the referees, a razor-thin balance of power is established in each duel. Several categories of competitions exist, each followed with rapt attention by the carnival goers. Lesser demons, marines, cultists, and, when Calva and Amoria can convince them to compete, even greater demons enter the ring to settle the score for which god is superior. Because of the sheer quantity of battles that take place on the surface, the Carnival of Slaughter is a popular spot for rival Chaos warbands to attempt eliminating each other. Chaos Lords duel each other within this arena, assured that they are evenly matched, and that their foe will not be allowed any dirty tricks. The conflict core of the Carnival's existence has had something of a snowball effect. When word of cornered champions defeat by Slaneshi champion spreads, three more appear to avenge them, and vice versa. While the forces of the Ordo Malleus have had great difficulty in destroying this heresy, having been defeated in both void and ground battles due to the swarms of Chaos contestants, it seems that they have taken the same approach that the Ordo Xenus took to Octarius. If the threat cannot be destroyed, then it must be contained. And if it can be contained, it can be used to their benefit. So, with the gentle prodding of the Inquisition, and viral word-to-mouth advertising by eager former contestants, the Carnival of Slaughter has been able to suck up dozens of Khorne and Slaanesh's most powerful combatants, making the Ordo Malleus' job within the region far easier. And, given Eredisus' proximity to the Eye of Terror, any help that the Inquisition can get is invaluable, especially now that it has grown into the Great Rift. Kanisha. However, even more disturbing to the Inquisition than the cruel and bloody competitions between the forces of Khorne and Slaanesh are the places in the carnival where they can peacefully coexist with one another. Alongside the fights to the death, several bizarre and unorthodox festivities populate the carnival of slaughter, which seem to fuse the traditions of both gods. Slaaneshi theatrics and ballads recounting the tales of brutal Khorne slaughter, Khornate death duels reenacting Slaaneshi romances in a kind of interpretive art, the crowds of these festivities are a sight truly frightening to behold. The servants of Khorne and Slaanesh getting along, laughing at the same war stories, singing the same grim war hymns. 
While reconnaissance into Aradisis and the carnival are deeply difficult to acquire, what little information we do have reveals that the Viseri twins appear to be growing nervous about this point of peace, almost as much as the Inquisition. For while Korn and Slanesh can put aside their differences just long enough to kill each other more brutally later, it seems the idea of the followers getting along is blasphemous, even to them. Calva and Amaria seem worried that this growing camaraderie will upset their as yet amenable guards and that they will finally be smited for their impertinence if these revelries continue. One possibility is all the more worrying. Ristel Corticus, a traitor lord of Chaos Undivided, claims that these revelries are more than just brief cooperations between Korn and Slanesh, but rather manifestations of will of a newly found emerging god, brought about the carnival's growing prominence. Kanisha, the god of spectacle, the loathsome bastard daughter of Korn and Slanesh's rivalry. And despite Calvar and Amaria's growing panicked attempts to find and silence him, his cult's numbers grow with each passing day. At first, the Inquisition put these thoughts aside as the delusional ravings of one madman among thousands on Aradisis, and indeed they very well may be just that. But now that the Great Rift has spread across the galaxy, and Aradisis has been bathed in its madding light, anything may be possible, even the birth of a new minor chaos entity. Nevertheless, the carnival rages on. The thirsting gods play their great game and the Imperium steals itself against the catastrophe that may yet come.